Some of you were my students, and some of you were my best friends in high school. I thought I was your best friend in high school, Jeremy, so I don't know who the, who the some are, so we'll have to talk about that later. Um, Mark said uh, that he's used to, uh, he's not getting used to uh, being the old guy. Can I just tell you, uh, when I remember Mark, I was in his second year. Uh, I, I started in 97, he started in 96, uh, Adam, uh, 97. I think you take a picture of the Mark I remember and you add just a little bit of gray hair, he looks exactly the same, don't you think? Yes, so I just wanted to encourage him along that line. Um, I also want to say thank you to whoever provided these uh, ESV uh, journals. I, I can't tell you how, how grateful I am for how the Spirit works. Um, on the way here, I was thinking the one thing I would love for everyone to have would be some sort of layout of Philippians with room to take notes, and if possible, in the ESV version, since that's what I'll, all my slides are tied to. And uh, what do you know? It's right there in front of you, and we're going to be using this. We're going to do an old-fashioned Bible study, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. So please get those out and get, get some pens out. The only thing I wish we had were different colored pens, but uh, you can do that later on your own time, uh, and we'll talk about why that's important. Um, I, I want to thank Jeremy and Mark for reinforcing that these Time restraints in the schedule are just suggestions. Um, so I plan about a 20-minute intro, a 30-minute Bible study, and then about five minutes of some preaching suggestions, and then, Lord willing, cover the time so you won't ask me any questions. Um, and, and I'm grateful to be with you, with you preachers. Uh, you know, the, the most preacher-like thing Mark said in his speech was, I was thinking of this uh, in the car on the way down here. Um, I love that line. And then, of course, the slide that said marriage or the church. And I thought, yes, preachers struggle with that debate all the time. <laughs> I'm just grateful to be with preachers because you hear, you heard a lot lately about frontline workers. Uh, I am surrounded by frontline workers. And I'm grateful for the work that you do. Uh, and to God be the glory. I want to start with the Edict of Milan. Uh, for nearly 300 years, Christianity was considered in many places an illegal religion in the Roman Empire. All the coins declared Caesar as Lord, Son of God, Savior of the world. And because of the cult of Caesar worship and, uh, or just the cruel whims, varying whims of the people in charge, Christians faced various levels of persecution arrest and torture and even execution. And that is until an epic showdown uh, in the year 312 when Constantine the Great defeated his usurper brother-in-law Maxentius at the Battle of the Mulvian Bridge. And then the following February in 313, Constantine, who controlled the Western Empire, met with uh, Emperor Licinius, who controlled the Balkans, and they signed an agreement in modern-day Milan that permanently established religious toleration of Christians throughout the empire, including the freedom to confess your faith and worship whatever deity you wish. Very, very quickly after that, in Philippi, the Roman-owned colony of Philippi, the first public Christian assembly hall was erected and dedicated to the memory of St. Paul. Now, we have found earlier places of worship Think about Dura Europos or the, the Roman catacombs. But this is the earliest known public Christian church building with open doors that can be dated with any certainty. The reason why that's fascinating is that archaeologists have uncovered several rooms in that church, including a baptistry connected to an underground water tunnel. And here's where the story gets fascinating. Next to the baptistry was a little room where instruction was given to those waiting on their baptism, catechumens. And this room sat on top of an old Heroon, which is a, a cemetery shrine for pagan heroes. Now, it was quite common for early Christians to bury their Christian heroes, their dead, in the same place as these pagan heroes. And archaeologists believe that in this cemetery contains the bones of the earliest Christian martyrs. Do you know what that means? It means that the water that filled the baptistry gushed forth from the martyr's tomb. Now, can you picture the scene? In the very place where earlier Roman guards would march up and down the street looking for anyone who would dare defy Caesar as Lord, 
new believers would be reading Paul's letter to the Philippians, get to the crescendo of the Christ hymn, stand to sing from the top of their lungs, Jesus is Lord and Caesar isn't, and be plunged into the water gushing forth from the bones of the martyrs that they in their baptism declared themselves to be joining. Philippians will preach. It's a hope-giving, heart-changing letter. It'll preach when a war-torn church in Kiev, hanging ever so loosely on to independence, reads a letter written from prison to a struggling church in an occupied Roman colony, telling them that it's been granted to them not only to believe in Christ, but to suffer for his sake, noting that while it might feel right to answer with might or to hang on to the shifting promises of loyalty and support from one country or another, their true citizenship is in heaven and that they await a savior from there who will one day subject all nations and all things to himself. Chapter one will preach when a now single mother feels abandoned and alone, struggling to raise her 14-year-old daughter who's going through an identity crisis herself, and this mother wonders if her faith in Christ makes any difference. But then she hears these stirring words from Paul in Philippians 1, I'm confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will stick with it, will stay at it, and see it through to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. Even when it doesn't seem like it, even when it doesn't feel like it, God's at work in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Chapter 2 will preach. When Gordon Fee, the eminent New Testament scholar, read an academic paper at the Society of Biblical Literature, but chose as his paper topic the Christ hymn of Philippians 2, he couldn't help but end the lecture with a rousing call to worship, ending with everyone in the audience standing and singing the doxology. Chapter 3 will preach. David Lipscomb, the venerate preacher and editor of the Gospel Advocate, known far and wide for taking firm stands on controversial issues, and the man with, with all the answers, he was the Bible answer man in the Gospel Advocate, sat down to write a commentary on Philippians, and he came to chapter 3 and read about the hope to receive righteousness, not of my own, but that which comes through faith in Christ, he was moved to write these words. Even when a man's heart is purified by faith and his affections all reach out towards God and seek conformity to the life of God, it is imperfect. His practice of the righteousness of God falls far short of the divine standard. The flesh is weak and the law of sin reigns in our members so that we fall short of the perfect standard of divine righteousness. But if we trust God implicitly and faithfully endeavor to do his will, he knows our frame, knows our weaknesses. And as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities our infirmities and weaknesses and imputes to us the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So Jesus stands at our, as our justification and our righteousness and our life is hid with Christ in God. Just a few verses later where, where Paul states, only let us hold fast to what we have attained. Lipscomb was given the opportunity to fill the page with references to all the hard and fast truths that he so ably debated over the years. But a different spirit moved him. If some have learned more than others, wrote Lipscomb, those who have learned the more must be patient and forbearing, striving to help all to learn more and more of the divine truth. None of us have learned the whole of that truth. Those who know least frequently assume that they know it all and are the most dogmatic and exclusive. And when one thinks he knows all of divine truth on any subject, he knows nothing as he ought to know it. The man who has the most faithfully studied the Word of God realizes what a mine of precious truth there is yet to be found in its sacred treasures. Let each learn all the truth he can, weigh all the difficulties, look upon every side of the question, teach to others what he learns, sacrifice no truth, but be patient and forbearing in teaching it. 
and the providences of God will favor the spread of the truth. And in the meantime, let him not despise or reject him who is seeking and striving to learn the will of God because he's not learned so much of the truth as we think we have. Chapter 4 will preach. Paul concludes his letter urging his his beloved brothers and sisters to stand firm in the Lord, to help one another agree in the Lord, and to let your kindness or your patience or your forbearance be known to all men. In 1958, while on a speaking tour, Martin Luther King Jr. was nearly killed when he was stabbed by an assailant in Harlem. It was almost as if he was expecting it. Because in March of that year, Dr. King gave these stirring words. We know that sacrifice is involved, that brutality will be faced, that savage conduct will need to be endured, that slick trickery will need to be overcome. But we are resolutely prepared for all of this. We are prepared to meet whatever comes with love, with firmness, and with unyielding nonviolence. Paul knew that the dream, the hope, did not always match lived reality. Our hope is eschatological. And that's why he writes in the next verse, the Lord is at hand. Drawing inspiration, MLK gave another memorable speech in Montgomery in 1965. I come to say to you this afternoon, however difficult the moment, however, however frustrating the hour, it will not be long. Because truth crushed to earth will rise again. How long? Not long. Because no lie can live forever. How long? Not long. Because you shall reap what you sow. How long? Not long. Because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. How long? Not long. Because mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. I guess my point is that when you're preaching Philippians, may I suggest to you that the first thing you ought to do is be inspired. I mean, Paul says, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Isn't that beautiful? And that's great advice for preaching this book. Jim McGuigan, the the prince of preachers who happens to be on the front row, which is where you need to be every Sunday. (laughs) He once preached a sermon years ago, and he said, we'll get around to preaching when Christ gets a hold of our hearts. Then we'll say what the apostolic pair said in Acts when they were told to stop preaching. They said, we'll beat you. And he said, beat on, but we can't help but teach and preach that which we have heard. Immerse yourself in the text. Read it as God's message of eternal friendship with a wicked world, calling forth believers to find peace and joy in the suffering servant, Christ the Lord. And when it comes to the book of Philippians, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. After you get excited and inspired and you can't help but talk about it, think about the background. Uh, Paul was very familiar with imprisonment. Clement, uh, years later, speaks of seven imprisonments and more beatings. Where Paul was imprisoned, in my opinion, makes little difference. Is he writing from Rome? Is he writing from Ephesus? Is he writing from Caesarea? Because once we figure out what prison he's in, then we can figure out what he's writing about. That, That doesn't work. The reason why that's not that important is because Paul is writing to the Philippians. And the Philippians are going through some difficulties, and Paul's connecting with them. Sometime take a look at uh, Abraham Malherby's work on Thessalonica, and you'll see that there were tombstones that lined the roads as you walked outside of of Thessalonica. And those tombstones had sayings on them, like, my life has gone out and sounded forth. And Paul, trying to think about how to write to a struggling church in Thessalonica, rips the lines right off the tombstones and then changes the way they think and says, your faith has sounded forth. And he does that all through the book. He speaks the language of the people he's writing to. Keep that in mind for a second. 
There were three types of Roman custody for prisoners awaiting trial in any place that had a Roman connection. The best was house arrest. Uh, this could be in your own home or a rented one. could be supervised by a family member. It usually allowed freedom of mobility and uh, reserved for senators and the very rich and the elite in society. A second option was military custody. And that's where the prisoner's arms and legs and feet would be chained with heavy irons to one or two soldiers under the direction of a centurion. You could write letters. You could receive visitors. You could even keep donations like food and clothing. I know at the end of Acts it mentions he's under some sort of house arrest, but I really believe we're talking about military custody here. And uh, the, the reference to fetters and chains would speak to that. But military custody often meant a shorter time spent in the last option, the prison, the shared prison. There were no individual cells in Roman prisons. One ancient writer said that there were 248 men and 48 women who shared a single prison. All the prisoners were together occupying the same space, sometimes with manacles around their necks or with chains around their feet and hands. Diodorus tells us that in one instance, there were nine mattresses used by 50 prisoners. There was an interior room, a basement room, called the Telonium, 12 feet below the floor. This is the darkest and most distressing part of the prison. It was cell block D, the most secure, the least access to windows, reserved for the most intense punishment and the most hated criminals. And guess what? Paul spent time in that kind of prison. And guess where? Philippi. In Acts 16, verse 24, they talk about taking him to the interior room in which they shackled him. So forget about where Paul is when he's writing this message. He's writing to folks in Philippi whose vision and understanding of prison is that. And Paul experienced that. And at the end of chapter 1, Paul says, You are now experiencing the same struggles I've had, and indeed you now hear I still have. So he's probably writing to people who may, in fact, firsthand know what that is like. Small and packed without much air, these dark and filthy prisons were ripe for sickness and disease, and for some writers, they'd rather die than continue to experience it. I mention all this because if you want to think like Paul, and you want to think like a first century Christian, read Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Letters and Papers from Prison. Read MLK's letter from a Birmingham jail. Read Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning that's written from his experiences in a concentration camp during the Holocaust. I agree with Gordon Fee that Philippians is a letter of friendship, according to literary conventions, but it's more than that. It's a letter from prison, which is a genre all its own. Elsa Thomas wrote, writes the, her contribution to the Wisdom Commentary series, and I'm really grateful that she interviews her friends in prison. And you begin to see startling connections to how people in prison write letters. During the uh, dictatorship in Uruguay in the late 70s and early 80s, one writer summarizing all the prison letters he was reading says this, at first thought, nothing seems as fragile as a sheet of paper. Nevertheless, nothing is more durable. When writings are an act of resistance, words remain beyond the reach of executioners. In the closed universe of prison, writing had to be reinvented. It was born between sessions of torture with a vocation to bear testimony, growing in the solitude of the cell where there were only memories and sheets of medical instructions. Even more to the point, Thomas says that prison is a theological location for Paul. People who spend years in prison don't just talk about an experience they had. It shapes how they see themselves. It changes your identity. And for Paul, Paul tries to get the church to reimagine the world as a prisoner 
for Christ. Think about it. A prisoner cannot rely on self-help. He can only wait for help from a higher power. And he calls for us to cry out for deliverance. A prisoner can't place his confidence in society's laws or about being superior to others. You're, you're all common criminals in the jail cell. And you can't take anything with you. You leave it all behind. You hear echoes of chapter 3 there, don't you? And what do you need most? What things could you most hope for? Grace and peace and mercy and a visit from a friend and some encouragement. I want to skip some things. And so Paul's using language in Philippians that may have crossed his own mind, but certainly would have crossed the mind of those to whom he's writing, or that would have been echoed in the prison walls of the city. You read chapter 1 and you hear language about staying or going, dying or, or living, and it reminds you of Socrates' oration as he drinks the hemlock, but it also sounds like a common occurrence in a Philippian prison cell. But Paul reframes the experience to his partners who share in the fellowship of suffering, he speaks proudly about how it helps him know Christ better and connect with others and participation in the spirit and participation in the gospel is to suffer together. And so even if my life is to be poured out as a drink offering, it will be for the better because in doing this, I know Christ Jesus my Lord in ways I never would have otherwise. The third thing is, uh, oh, by the way, uh, read all these books. Okay, uh, <laughs> these, slides, these slides will be available for you afterwards. Third, adopt some theological lenses. It's my, it's my suggestion, my contribution for today. There's, there's long been a rift between biblical studies and systematic theology, but that space is closing. And uh, for that, I thank God. For a century in the academy, biblical studies forced readers to think smaller and smaller, asking questions like, uh, is Philippians really uh, three letters and not one? Just so you know, critical scholarship will tell you that letter number one from Paul is chapter 4, verse 10 to verse 20. And letter two from Paul is chapter 1, verse 1 to chapter 3, verse 1, and chapter 4, verses 2 through 9. And letter three from Paul is chapter 3, verse 2, down to chapter 4, verse 1. Did you get all that? I want to come back to that, but I want you to just keep that in mind for a second. Or they'll ask, what words and cognates occur most frequently uh, to render internal highlights? Uh, to be reluctant to smuggle into Paul's own words from other letters, and to be faithful to the text, making sure you don't lay some larger meta narrative over it, like the early Christian creeds, or to take into account uh, you know, the way the letter was received over the years of Christian history. Meanwhile, on the other hand, systematic theology often forced readers to think bigger and bigger, rarely stopping, in some cases, to do the spade work within the letter itself, smoothing over any rough edges or complicated differences, and, and often leaving every writer and book saying the same seven bland things. But I'm loving what I'm seeing now from both directions. Uh, there are theological commentaries on the Bible written by historical and systematic theologians who bring their training to bear on a close reading of the book. John Mark did one of these uh, in writing in Chronicles. Uh, these include George Hunsinger's uh, Brazos commentary, which uh, Paul Norwood now has, and you all can fight him for it, uh, or Daniel Migliori's 2014 uh, belief commentary. Uh, they are unashamed to approach the book canonically, to look for how the book helps elucidate the central truths of the historic Christian faith and how it feeds into the historical debates within the Christian church. They're honest with the text and they're asking what the text is saying, but even more importantly, in my opinion, how the text speaks to the whole structure of what Paul was getting at in every sermon. And from the other side, you have biblical, theolo biblical scholars like uh, Lynn Kohick or... Um, or uh, uh, Bird, uh, Michael Bird, 
who are writing with theology in mind. And I see this lovely connection happening. And so uh, may I suggest, uh, and this is just my, my approach, um, that we talk about Philippians in the next 30 minutes or so with theological lenses, thinking about how Philippians contributes to the larger story of God that is the heart of every sermon in the New Testament. You could start in a number of places. You could look at the seven ones of Ephesians 4, which turns out to be the seven themes that appear and reappear in every major speech in the book of Acts. They're also the basic outline for the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. They represent the table of contents in any book on what Christians believe. And so, uh, since we received the letter of Philippians not in isolation, but as part of the canon that tells a unifying story of the church, I begin by asking, what light does Philippians shed on the Christian gospel that every sermon I give should ultimately be about? In my opinion, if you preach Philippians and people don't know God better, you have failed to preach Philippians as Paul intended it. If you preach Philippians and the students who are listening to you don't know who Christ is or what the gospel is or what it means to be the church better, then we fail to preach Philippians as Paul intended. So let's start with God. And now we're going to do some um, Bible study. This print is terribly small. But what I'd like you to do is to open up the, 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 the sweet little book that was provided for you. And with a pen in hand, you may just want to circle or highlight or put a block around certain key words or verses. And over to the right, maybe write G for God. And we're going to look at these seven themes as, we, or as they show up in the book of Philippians. My phone is dead. Uh, could somebody tell me what time? Or I'm not going to oh, turn it on for reasons already mentioned. Uh, what, what? 151. 151. Great. I'm way behind. All right. We start with God. We know that God exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. But Son and Spirit have their own specialty areas, Christology, pneumatology. Theology proper wants to begin by asking, who is the one whom Jesus is praying to, the one who, who sends the Spirit? And in the Christ hymn of chapter 2, we learn that Jesus was equal with God, but emptied himself and assumed the form of a servant. So it becomes clear, first of all, chapter 2, verse 6, will be the first place you want to draw a line. God in Philippians is the highest. And it's implicit in chapter 3 and verse 20 that he makes his abode in heaven. That's where the Savior comes from. Now, it would be easy to assume that God, the highest in the heavens, is some remote, distant deity who does nothing but creates and judges. But Philippians tells us he's our Father. Chapter 1, verse 2, and several other places. And what do we, what do we receive from the Father? Grace, verse 2. Peace, verse 2. In fact, in chapter 4, verses 7 and 9, He's the God of all peace. Wisdom, chapter 3 and verse 15. Mercy, chapter 2 and verse 27. And abundant supply, chapter 4 and verse 19. In fact, God supplies your every need according to the riches that are in Christ Jesus. In chapter 3 and verse 9, we find our righteousness in God. In chapter 1 and verse 28, we find our salvation in God. These are gifts from God. And thus it is His upward calling, God's upward calling for which we strive. And what has God done according to the letter to the Philippians? Well, in chapter 2 verse 9, He exalted Christ after His death and His resurrection, giving Him a name that is above every other name. And then you say, yes, but what has he done for me lately? <laughs> Three things. First of all, he has been with you. Chapter 1, verse 6, he began a good work in you. He's going to see it through to completion. He has been with you. Second of all, he is with you. Chapter 2, verse 13. He's at work in you. 
both to will and to do his good pleasure. And then number three, he will be with you. Chapter four, verse nine, the God of all peace will be with you. Our God is a deliverer. Chapter four, verse six, he hears our prayers. Chapter two, verse 27, he has mercy on the ill. Chapter 1, verse 19, He delivers from death in prison. He reveals His wisdom to those who seek to be wise. He guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, and He supplies every need. That's our God. Now, what's our response to that merciful God of peace, the God of all glory? Well, first of all, verse 3, thankfulness. And not just that, it makes us unafraid. Look in verse 28. It makes us unafraid. And in chapter 4, verse 6, it makes us less anxious. And for those reasons, we, we're called to let God know what's on our hearts. We're called to obey Him. Chapter 2, verse 12. We're called to give Him all the glory. Chapter 4, and verse 20. I'm going fast, but I want you to see Philippians tells us who God is. And what about Jesus Christ? Oh, look at that. I missed a slide. Uh, What about Jesus Christ? It's very hard not to be a Trinitarian when you're reading Philippians. After all, there's only one Lord. The Old Testament makes it abundantly clear. There's one Lord. And besides me, there is no other. And the word Lord does not permit for for shared status. Just ask Caesar. If Caesar's Lord, no one else can be. And yet Philippians presents Jesus Christ as both Lord and Savior. He clearly labels him Savior in chapter 3, verse 20. And he names him Lord six times, starting in verse 2. That forces the reader to keep Christ in mind every time Paul refers to the Lord. In the Lord, we place our trust, 224. In the Lord, we have confidence, 114. We rejoice in the Lord. We stand firm in the Lord. We agree in the Lord. The phrase, the Lord is at hand, is parallel to the long-expected day of Christ in verse 6. Our Lord and Savior is Jesus Christ and Caesar isn't. And Jesus is the object of our confession. And not ours only. Every tongue in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And he has the power to subject all things to himself. And yet, he forgoes power for service. Our Lord and Savior, though equal with God, emptied himself, took upon himself humanity, and humbled himself even to death on a cross, but death couldn't hold him. He experienced resurrection and exaltation, and believe it or not, says Paul, he made me his own and will come to save and transform our bodies. Of course, we find in Christ what Paul already ascribed to God, grace and peace and all the rest. But also what's interestingly true about God because Christ experienced human suffering. In chapter 2 and verse 5, he talks about the humble mind that is yours in Christ Jesus. And as Paul longs to know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings. This phrase, in Christ, is a really important one. It speaks of our spiritual location. It speaks of our sphere of influence, our drawing power, the vantage point from which we reimagine our sufferings. The saints, you and I, are in Christ. And Paul longs for that one day when we're going to be found in him. It reminds me of that beautiful line in Colossians, for your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when God, who is your life, appears, you also will appear with him in glory. Everything takes place in, of, or for Christ Jesus. In chapter 1, Paul's a servant of Christ. In verse 2, the saints are in Christ. In verse 13, Paul's imprisonment is for Christ. So we're called to preach Christ and rejoice that he's preached because to live is Christ and so we glory in Christ Jesus. 
And in chapter 2, we're called to have the mind of Christ, to seek Christ's interests, and that can be brutal. Epaphroditus nearly died for the work of Christ, but that's par for the course. Paul says in chapter 3, whatever we've gained, we count as loss for the sake of Christ. All is rubbish compared to knowing and gaining Christ. What about the Holy Spirit? There are four explicit references to the Spirit in Philippians. Your prayers, this is chapter 1, verse 19, your prayers with the help of the Spirit of Jesus will lead to deliverance. In verse 27, Paul wishes to hear that the church is standing firm in one spirit. I agree with uh, Fee and uh, Harrington and Hunsinger that this is a reference to the Holy Spirit because unity is, first of all, a gift. And secondly, a goal. If there is any participation in the Spirit, Paul writes in chapter 2, verse 1, then be of one accord. And then in chapter 3, verse 3, we worship by the Spirit of God. Even leaving out 127, you still have three references that point to a Trinitarian reading. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus, and participation in the Spirit. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. We read that God is at work in you, releasing from prison, supplying every need. Throughout Scripture, these are actions done by the Spirit of God who dwells within you. The language of partaking or sharing in grace and suffering speaks to the participation in the Spirit, the same Spirit that led Jesus from the, into the wilderness and that may lead you and I through the valley of the shadow of death. And just as God, by His Spirit, raised Jesus from the dead, we will be raised and will experience the transformation of our bodies. Though the text says that Christ will do this, it also says Christ will do this, chapter 3, verse 21, by the power that enables Him, which throughout the Gospels and Acts refers to God's Holy Spirit. Paul calls the church to grow in spiritual fruit, and to use spiritual gifts leading up to the day of Christ. This language is used elsewhere in Paul for what it means to be led by the Spirit. We see the fruit of the Spirit listed like love and joy and peace and forbearance, which covers patience and kindness and gentleness. We see implicit calls to self-control. We see reference to the attitudes quickened by the Spirit like boldness and courage and being unafraid. Just as Paul says in Galatians, if we're led by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit, Paul calls us to press on. That's no self-help language, but to walk according to the good example set before us. What about the one faith, the Christian story, the gospel of Christ? We can start by seeing the obvious. The message about Christ is Christ. Chapter 1, verse 15, preach Christ. Verse 21, to live is Christ. The goal, chapter 3, verse 8, is to gain Christ, to know Him, to be found in Him. But it's not just an exalted, powerful Christ that we come to know. It's the one who chooses the cross as a way of life. It's told dramatically in chapter 2. And we're warned against those who live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Chapter 3, verse 18. So the gospel for Paul is of a suffering servant who's now Lord of all and in whom we find our life, our purpose, and our being. And that's a message that needs to be shared. And so Paul is placed in prison for the defense of the gospel. But his imprisonment has only served to advance the gospel. And as fellow prisoners, they're emboldened by the acts of God, so they speak the word without fear. And that's no individualist message. It's a corporate message. God saves a people. So Paul writes to a people, and we share in and are partakers of this gospel. Paul speaks of your partnership in the gospel and partakers in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Even Timothy serves alongside me in the gospel, and the Christians in Philippi have labored side by side for the faith of the gospel. Even sharing goods among churches to spread the word is sharing in the gospel. 
and the gospel is evidenced in a changed life. Paul speaks of your progress and your joy in the faith as he calls Christians to hold fast to the word of life and to let your manner of life, which literally means exercise of citizenship, be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Ernest Saunders points out the gospel shouldn't be reduced to a set of theological statements. It calls for a transformed way of being and doing, not just thinking. And if the gospel is Christ, let it be the full Christ that we see portrayed in Philippians. And the gospel calls for a response. You can take a picture of that if you want to <laughs> have to move on. The gospel calls for a response. I'm always weary of smuggling in, into passages things that aren't there. But I trust the ancient lens that tells us that one baptism is truly present when the Christian story is told. And so I look with ancient eyes to see the language of partakers of grace and partnership in the gospel and participation in one spirit. And I'm reminded, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, where Paul says, We were all baptized in one spirit and made to drink of that one spirit. Or Acts 2 where this promise of receiving God's Spirit is made to you and to your children and to all that are far off in baptism. When Paul says that he wants to gain Christ and be found in Him with a righteousness that comes by faith, I hear echoes of Galatians, which is we're all children of God by faith, for as many as have been baptized into Christ have, have put Him on like a garment. In chapter 2, we're called to have the mind of Christ who emptied himself, became obedient to death, and was raised from the dead, and thus we too are called to be obedient. Chapter 2, verse 12. But in chapter 3, Paul says, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. I have no doubt that he's willing to do that literally. But every Christian has accepted that fate figuratively. We're told that in Romans 6, 1 through 6, or Colossians 2, 12 through 13. Even the phrase, the sacrificial offering of your faith, in chapter 2, verse 17, implies the language of death that we accepted in our baptism. What time is it, Monty? It is 2.07. Excellent. What about the church? What do we learn about the church, the body of Christ? Those are saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. And God's at work in his church. The church is called to act like Christ. So no more grumbling or disputing. No more being anxious or placing confidence in the flesh or dwelling on the past. Instead, we're called to be unafraid and boldly speak the word without fear, to live lives worthy of the gospel, to be shining lights in a dark world, to rejoice, to show affection and sympathy and encouragement, to obey God, to hold firm to the word of life, and to work out your salvation with godly fear and trembling. And you have the language of sharing. The church should share good examples and welcome messengers. They are partners, after all, in the gospel and in prayer and in suffering and in the spirit and in giving and receiving. This is where many scholars have noted a particular occasion of the letter that comes into play. You know that mirror reading, which is where you look for Paul saying there seems to be a problem and saying, well, that must be the thing he's writing about or if he has a solution, that must have been the problem that is the main issue here, can have his strengths and weaknesses. But sometimes it's helpful. And usually when Paul writes a letter, he's trying to deal with some problem. But in this book, there seems to be one. There's these two women who are having trouble getting along. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. And it's a serious problem, as I'll show you in a second. He builds his theological case this way. First, sorry. 
Paul says the good of the whole trumps self-interest. In chapter 1, Paul says, To depart and be with Christ is better for me, but to stay is better for you. Get this. Therefore, I'm confident that I will stay. Roll that around for, for a second. I'm confident that I'll be staying. What's better for you trumps what seems best for me. To avoid selfish ambition, writes Paul in chapter 2, in humility, count others more significant than yourself. Look to the interests of others and ultimately to the interests of Christ. Second, Paul calls the church to stand together in one spirit, having the same mind, the same love, being in full accord, working side by side. Jeremy, uh, uh, my roommate and uh, his best friend, um, once told a story when he was 17 years old. I heard him preach for the first time, and I'll always remember this story. He said that there's a man who falls overboard on a cruise ship. It's a tragic tale that ends in the loss of one life. But the boat returns to shore, and life goes on. But now imagine that everyone on the boat is tied together with a rope. If one falls off, it affects us all. We either save the one or we all fall in. This is Paul's view of fellowship in the church. Together is the operative word. Third, Paul grounds these two points in the story of Christ. What is better for you all trumps what is best for me, and we are to have the same mind as we stand together, and that's what it means to have the mind of Christ. He tells of Christ choosing what was better for you over what seemed best for him as he stood by the will of God. And all of us saints are in Christ, and that means we put on display his story, bearing the marks of the Lord Jesus. Words like humility, emptied, servant, obedient, death, and cross fill the Christ hymn. If the church is the body of Christ, what do we learn about the body of Christ? It chooses the cross. Fourth, Paul contrasts the gospel of the cross with everything else that could be claimed as its rival. Every yeah but gets laid aside. Paul speaks of those who live as enemies of the cross, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, who glory in their shame, who are fixated on earthly things. But we saints in Christ live out the story of the cross of Christ. Our end is good in the day of Christ. Our God is found on the cross. Our glory is only in Christ Jesus, and we count every earthly thing as rubbish that we might gain Christ and be found in the body of the suffering Messiah. After all, our citizenship is in heaven. Our salvation comes from there, and our Savior will subject all things to himself. And that's how we have the courage to live out that story even now. Therefore, Paul writes, get along. He calls them my brothers and my beloved togetherness. He says, stand firm in the Lord, one mind. He pleads with these women to agree in the Lord, literally, to have the same mind. And he pleads with another to help these women who have labored side by side in the gospel. Have the mind of Christ, have it together, and whatever the argument, whatever the reason, Count it as rubbish as you take up the cross of Christ. Why in the world was this so important? I'll tell you why. Because in the world there is no hope. And Christ and Caesar are competing gods. These are two competing views of life 
and directions for the future. One is about power, the other is about surrender. And if two saints in Christ cannot find peace, joy, and love, if they cannot have the same mind to strive together in the gospel, then the cross of Christ means nothing. We come finally to the one hope. This is clearly a hope-filled letter. Paul can speak of living with hope for tomorrow because of the one in whom he has put his trust. Confidence. Confidence in the face of opposition, chapter 1, verse 28, is a clear sign of your salvation. Paul expected deliverance, and he lived with the eager expectation that Christ would be honored in his body no matter what. Even if he was going to be poured out as a drink offering, he knew it would only mean that he would be permitted to depart and be with Christ. Hope paved the way as he left the past behind and reached forth, pressing on to the goal of the prize. This is why he could even find hope in suffering, seeing it as a gift and an opportunity to experience the fellowship of his sufferings. And he shared this hope with the saints. He calls them my crown, which refers to the victor's crown at the end of the race, in whom he wouldn't be ashamed of the day of Christ. He says, you're all written in the book of life. The Christian hope is rooted in our citizenship in heaven, and we await a Savior from there who will transform our bodies. One day we'll experience that day of Christ in which we will be pure and blameless, we'll be found in Him, and every knee will bow and confess Jesus is Lord. And we're going to know the power of His resurrection, and we'll attain the resurrection for ourselves as he transforms our bodies to be like his glorious body, subjects all things to himself, ends all ungodliness, and will give all glory to God forever and ever. Amen. This is the Christian story, according to Philippians. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not specific themes in the book worthy of preaching. What it does mean is, whenever you're dealing with specific themes worthy of preaching, make sure by the end of the sermon you get around to telling the gospel and that people know God and meet Christ in your sermon. So here are some things. The centrality of Christ or the spiritual attitude of joy and rejoicing or our posture as prisoners for Christ and suffering slaves or maybe the requirements of Christian friendship. Stephen Fowle's commentary on Philippians has an appendix on what it means to be a Christian friend, according to Philippians. Pretty good stuff. Or partnership and sharing as the community of Christ. Here's a nice three-part sermon against self-centeredness. I earned my own salvation. Well, read chapter 3. I was already perfected. Read the rest of chapter 3. I'll do whatever pleases me. Read the end of chapter 3. <coughs> Or maybe what is involved in having the Christian mind. Or contrasting the gospel with everything else. But you see, all of these are opportunities to remind people of the central truths of the Christian faith from which Paul gains his emphasis and his interest for his theology and his um, uh, practice of the faith. I told you at the beginning that critical scholarship seems to say that they're originally Uh, Philippians was three letters. I don't know what you think about that. I I think most preachers, when they hear that, do one of three things. Number one, toss it. Uh, It's not going to preach. Who cares? Let's move on. And if that's your view, that's fine. Second view is to fully embrace it and then to try to use the pulpit as an opportunity to sound like you really read these German folks a lot. And uh, if I can name all the numbers and where the breaks are, I sound pretty smart. I think the third option is to use it in the service of your preaching by saying whether or not it was originally three letters, at least these critical scholars are helping us find seams, which help us locate literary units. And if that's the case, I need to step back and say, that's interesting. What would be the three centers of the book if we're dealing with three sections? And what I find is in uh, letter number two, which is one, one through three, one and four, two through nine, I see Jesus is Lord. And if he's Lord, it requires us to respond the way he tells Euodia and Syntyche to respond. 
And then in letter 3, which is chapter 3, verse 2 through chapter 4, verse 1, I see that Jesus is Savior. See, if He's Lord, then He commands my response to serve like Him. And if He's Savior, then I've got reason to talk about how I can count everything as lost because I'm going to be found in Him and have His righteousness, and He's going to come back to save me. Okay, I saw those, but now I'm kind of forced to think there must be something, chapter 4, verses 10 through 20, which I originally thought was an afterthought. But if that's letter one, then I need to step back and say, well, okay, what can I do with that? And here's what I see. It's kind of weird. It begins with, hey, by the way, thanks for the gift, not that I needed it, but uh, I used it. Thanks for joining me in the gospel. See you later. Is it possible that the third central point here is that sharing in the gospel has tangible fruit? What does it mean? This sounds like 1 John. What does it mean to call Jesus Savior and Lord if you don't help a brother out? Sharing in the gospel somehow must lead to the hungry get fed, and those in prison have visitors, and those who are thirsty have something to drink, and that what's in your pocket is given to others. Sharing in the gospel has tangible fruit. Well, my time uh, is over. Uh, when you plan out your preaching, I have nothing to offer you except what I found is a couple of good books. I want to recommend some. Uh, it's in the bibliography. Uh, Ernest Saunders' Little Knox Preaching Guides is uh, magnificent. Really some great uh, sermon starter ideas. And the other is uh, more in Sprinkle's Carrick's commentary. The first 20 pages, they lay out kind of section by section sermon ideas and sermon pointers for each section of Philippians. It's really valuable and helpful, and I recommend those to you. But then the last thing you should do is to put some so what action items to your sermons. Uh, what does God want us to know and believe? What does God want us to do? And what does He want us to become? And I want to suggest that if you're using Philippians as a whole, here would be Paul's answers. What does God want you to know and believe and affirm? He wants you to know that God is at work even in your suffering. That He's at work in Christ, the model of servant-heartedness. That through participation in the one spirit and growing in spiritual fruit and sharing Christ, that the gospel is Christ as citizens of heaven. And that our obedience involves emptying and becoming like Him in His death. And as His body, we imitate the cross-shaped life standing firm side by side with one mind, and we share the one hope of our Savior from heaven, longing for the day of Christ. What does He want us to do? He wants us to join Christ in His life and work, to pray more and dispute less, to find joy even in suffering, to serve the needs of the body above my own interests, and to partner with the Spirit in the church to the glory of God. And what does He want us to become? He wants us to grow more loving, more joyful, more peaceful, more patient. He wants us to be led by the Spirit of Christ to become more and more like Christ. Let me end by borrowing another story I heard from McGuigan, who I think he heard it from someone else maybe. That one day we're going to be in heaven and the angels are going to be looking at us and pointing at us and talking to each other. And we're going to shuffle over to hear what they're saying because nobody likes to be pointed at and whispered about. And we're going to overhear them saying, wow, doesn't he, doesn't she look just like Christ? Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? Our hope is secure. Our future is certain. And we're going to look just like Him. Let's look at each other through that lens. And let's be the people of God. Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you for your book of Philippians. Teach us to be like you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I hope I covered up all the Q&A time because I've told you everything I know about Philippians. <laughs> what time we have? You actually have 10 minutes for oh, questions and answers. Okay, <laughs> 10 minutes. But it looks like you had no questions. <laughs> Thank you. I've got one.
Barry. Have you ever heard of the theory, and I can't remember which one, that between Euodia and Syntyche, that one of them was, was Lydia, the first convert in Philippi? It's funny you say that, and I don't have an answer on this, but okay. um, Elsa Thomas in her wisdom commentary says the loyal yoke fellow is Lydia. You know, the other person to help these two women. Uh -huh. um, sometimes we, we, we draw conclusions from what little we know. And we, we make things fit, and maybe they do. Um, I don't know what to think about that. Yes, sir? As you've gotten through, you just basically showed us, I guess, how to preach more theologically through the book than... Um, Expositionally, <coughs> uh, what's the pluses or minuses to either one of those? Well, I, I guess my thought was um, I have I have no training in <coughs> preaching. Um, I mean, my dad was a preacher, but I didn't take very many preaching classes. And I, you all can teach me on how to do that homiletically. <coughs> and most of you have had courses and exegetical readings. I wanted to offer what what I had to offer, which was this is what it would look like from a theological reading. If nothing else, incorporate some of this into your preaching to remind the church of the Christian story as often as possible. Amen. Yes. Amen. Great. Thank you all. God bless. I've enjoyed being with you. Thank you so much.